Anyone with even the most fleeting interest in football is likely to be familiar with the term offside, even if they don't understand exactly what it means. The term itself is actually borrowed from military dialect as a contraction of the phrase off the strength of his side. A soldier who was deemed to be off the strength was no longer part of his unit and was as such no longer entitled to pay, rations or privileges. Similarly, a footballer who is adjudged to be offside essentially ceases to be a part of his team until he is played onside and loses the privileges of being able to get involved in play. The current offside rule dictates that a player is in an offside position if any of their body parts, except for the hands and arms, are in the opponent's half of the pitch and closer to the opponent's goal line than both the ball and the second to last opponent. The last opponent naturally tends to be a goalkeeper, but the rules do not dictate that it has to be. Just being in an offside position is not an offence punishable by the referee. For the referee to take action, they or their linesman must judge that the player has become involved in play. Typically, that involves the offside player receiving possession of the ball, but again, the rules do not dictate that the offside player has to actually touch the ball. Obstructing a goalkeeper's view or distracting an opponent could legitimately be described as being involved in play and therefore a foul. Why, you may ask, is HITC7's guy boring you to death by explaining the offside rule that 99% of my subscribers will be familiar with? Well, it came to my attention when I first started this channel in 2017 and on multiple occasions since that there is an awful lot of confusion about the history of the offside rule. Particularly when I've talked about Pele, a great number of people have taken to the comments to point out that there was no offside rule during the Brazilian's time, and that is one of the reasons why he was so prolific. I've since seen similar sentiments echoed outside of the YouTube comment section on my videos, although they resurfaced on the channel with my recent video looking at Mario de Castro and some of the most prolific goalscorers of all time. Now, those who assume that it would have been much easier to score goals without any offside rule are not mistaken, but I'm not sure where they've got the idea that there was no offside rule when Pele was playing, or any footballer from the last 150 years for that matter. Given that the offside rule has historically been the most hotly debated law in the entire laws of the game and is as controversial as ever in the current climate of VAR, twin with the historical inaccuracies that seem to be rather commonplace, I thought it would be a good topic to take on. Given that Pelé retired in 1977, I'm not sure when some people think the offside rule came into force, presumably sometime in the 1980s, 90s or 2000s. In truth, the offside rule is almost as old as football itself, at least in its codified form. At the very oldest, we can trace football back in its current form to the early to mid 1800s, where it began to spring up alongside rugby in a number of well-to-do fee-paying schools in the United Kingdom. The sport pretty quickly began to gather some traction, and by the 1840s, if not earlier, some schools were starting to codify their own rules of the game. The 1847 Eton rules are among the earliest known examples, and even they included an offside rule, although the term offside doesn't appear to have yet been in use. Eaton used the arguably more apt and certainly more charming term of sneaking to describe a player who is in an offside position, and a player would be judged to be sneaking if only three or less than three opposition players were between him and the goal. That was 173 years ago, and although the number of players required to render a player offside has changed, that is very similar to the modern offside rule. The first Cambridge rules were drafted in 1848 and rewritten in 1856 in an attempt to create a more universal set of rules for all schools and universities to follow. The Cambridge rules were much stricter than the Eton rules, stating that if the ball had travelled from the direction of a player's own goal, they may not touch it until the other side have kicked it again. The Sheffield rules of 1855 were next, and they included no offside rule at all. As a result, teams deployed what were known as kick-throughs, simply players who spent the entire game in front of the opposition goal, waiting for the opportunity to score an easy tap-in. That is a role still common in playground football, and has since been renamed with terms such as goal-hanging and Gary Lineker. In 1863, the Football Association formed and attempted to create a universal, inarguable set of rules, which they named the laws of the game. To give some perspective to the formative years that football was in at this time, it's worth noting that the rugby school rules still allow players to pick up and carry the ball, although opponents were then allowed to kick the shins of the player carrying the ball in a practice known as hacking. Hacking naturally died out when carrying the ball was removed from the game, although a handful of players such as Pepe and Carl Henry apparently never got the memo. Anyhow, when the Football Association were confronted with the difficult decision of offsides, they opted to follow the stricter Cambridge rules. The initial laws of the game stated that, when a player has kicked the ball, any one of the same side who is nearer to the opponent's goal line is out of play and may not touch the ball himself, nor in any way whatsoever prevent any other player from doing so. 
The only exception to this rule was in the case of goal kicks, in which the ball could be kicked forward and players could then receive possession. For anyone struggling to understand this concept, which is very different to the current offside rule, in essence, you could only pass the ball sideways or backwards. So, in other words, it was a bit like watching Eric Dyer. Joking aside, football essentially employed the same offside rule as rugby in the FA's initial 1863 laws of the game. This would have an enormous impact on football's pivotal early years, even once the rule changed. It put a huge emphasis on individualism and dribbling, since that was the only way to get your team up the pitch. This style of play would prevail for more than a decade, up until the Scots pioneered a passing style of play that proved effective against the individual brilliance of the England team in the 1870s. When England first played Scotland in 1872, England played a 1-1-8 formation. Meanwhile, the more pass-orientated Scots went with the more conservative 2-2-6 formation. Despite there being 14 forwards on the pitch in total, the game ended in a 0-0 draw. In the 1860s and 70s, no rule was more frequently debated between clubs than the offside rule. In the 1860s, Sheffield rules went from having no offsides to deciding that there must be one member of the defending team between a forward and the opponent's goal, which is essentially the system which is in place now. Two to three years after the laws of the game were first published in 1863, the FA amended them to include the Cambridge offside clause, stating that there must be more than three opposition players between the attacker and the goal, and later that there must be at least three opposition players between the attacker and the goal. It was clear to most people that unlike rugby, football was a sport which needed forward passes and increased fluidity in terms of the way in which teams moved the ball. From 1866 onwards, almost every form of football had an offside rule of sorts, but still allowed forward passes. Wanderers in England centre forward Charles W. Alcock, the man who masterminded the FA Cup, was the first player to be caught offside in an official fixture in March 1866 in a clash between the FA and Sheffield. In 1873, the rule stated that a player could only be ruled offside at the moment of kicking the ball, but in 1903, the Council of the Football Association said that it was a breach of law when a player in an offside position causes play to be affected. However, that rule wasn't really clarified up until 1924, by which time an international board had been formed, and they wrote clearly that if a player who is in an offside position advances towards an opponent or the ball and in doing so causes the play to be affected, he should be penalised for interfering with play. It's worth noting that it was only in 1891 that umpires were removed from football and replaced by on-field referees and linesmen. This led to the creation of the first Referees Association and Referees Chart, which improved the dialogue between referees and led to a significant increase in consistency throughout football in Britain. Other significant landmarks include corner kicks becoming exempt from the offside rule in the 1881-82 season, offsides becoming limited to only the opposition's half of the pitch in 1907, and throw-ins becoming exempt from offsides in 1921. Following almost 60 years of only very minor alterations, in 1925, a serious change was made to the offside rule. It came after the Scottish FA proposed the idea of reducing the number of players required to render a player to be in an offside position from 3 to 2 to the international board. The Scots weren't the only ones to have this idea. By the 1920s, the 1866 offside law had been mastered by most defences, who lined up diagonally so as to make it almost impossible for a forward player to receive a through ball without being caught offside. It had made football almost chess-like, and many were becoming tired of the constant offsides and decreases in goals. The international board voted in favour of the rule change, and in the 1925-26 season, 6,373 goals were scored throughout the Football League up from just 4,700 goals the previous season in as many games. Not everyone reveled in the rule change though. Defenders had to rethink the tactics they'd mastered over a number of years, and some supporters felt the overall quality of the game had been reduced. To counter the rule change, in the mid-1920s, teams began experimenting with moving one of their halfbacks into the defence, thus creating the centre-half. Herbert Chapman is the man often credited with creating the centre-half position and the WM formation, but in truth, he wasn't the first manager to do it, just the first to perfect it. The next significant shift came in 1956, when the IBD decided that offside isn't based on the player's position when they receive the ball, but rather when that ball is played to them. This freed up forwards to make more daring and risky runs, and promoted more adventurous and creative balls from midfield. The 1925 reduction from three to two defensive players required to put a player in offside position lasted for 65 years. Following Italia 90, the rule changed to its current form, ruling that a player is onside when they are in line with or deeper than the second to last defender when the ball is played to them. 
As within 1965, the 1990 alteration was made with the intention of freeing up the game to promote more fluid and attacking sport. Minor changes have come into play since then, such as the switch from any body part being able to rule the offside to any body part other than the arms and hands in 2005, for the reason that they are the only two body parts that you cannot use in football, and therefore, you cannot gain an advantage by them being in an offside position. Of course, we have now seen the offside rule being taken to whole new extremes thanks to VAR, with players with size 11 boots being punished over those with size 8 boots. So fine have the margins become. In truth, the offside rule has always existed to prevent your opponent gaining unfair advantage. The original idea of a player deemed to be sneaking rather than offside says it all. The rule is there to stop goal hanging, not to punish players for millimetres in decisions that could be watched 1,000 times by 100 different referees without a conclusive decision being reached. Anyhow, that's a different rant for a different time, and that is my history of the offside rule, and hopefully it'll go some way towards rectifying some of the myths that have been spread about offside over the years. Understanding the offside rule is actually key to understanding the history of football and the reason why it has historically been, and arguably continues to be, the most controversial refereeing tool that exists. Without it, or even with slight variations to it, positions, formations and the very fabric of the sport would be completely altered. This is one of those videos that will prompt my boss into threatening to sack me when it's only watched by about 15 people, but I enjoy making videos like this, so thanks to all of you who've tuned in. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it or found it to be informative or entertaining, and please do feel free to subscribe to HITC7s and turn on notifications.